I'd like to just take a minute and uh, tell you about Chaplain Boatwright. I won't read his bio. You can read that. It's, it's uh, lengthy. Uh, and if you know every unit in the Army, he's been in just about every unit in the Army. But I will tell you, I knew uh, Chaplain Boatwright in Japan. Uh, I was at, at Yokota Air Force Base at U.S. Forces Japan, and he was at Zama with uh, uh, the Army, uh, the Army Command for the U.S. Army in Japan, and and uh, <clears throat> and I I was the president of the Far East Council of the Boy Scouts of America, and uh, I mean that's a difficult job to to fill. It's not a difficult job to do. They just need to get somebody to do it. And uh, when I left. Chaplain Boatwright took my job as the president of the Far East Council of the Boy Scouts of America. So I appreciate, I appreciate that and appreciate all he's done. So I know the presentation he's going to give today is going to be uh, very insightful and very informative. And, and I saw a little bit of that uh, the other day. So uh, we all know who Chaplain Boatwright is. We appreciate him for all that he's done. And I'd like to turn the time over to him. And say, thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, Miriam is home sleeping. She was up all night till about four in the morning, um, just as I was getting up <laughs> to get ready for today. And we both agreed that I would come uh, present today and then we would go. We saw her dad last night at 7.30 p.m. and he was doing okay. He was sleeping at a, a rest home here in town. And uh, as we were getting ready to go, he said, prayer. We said, sure, great dad. And we knelt with him and had prayer together, and we kissed him goodbye. Two hours later, we got the call. He'd been uh, helped to the restroom and had slumped down and was gone. So we thought, as we've talked with family about that, we thought, gosh, what a great way to go <laughs> when you're going to go. <laughs> so, yeah. He was faithful to the end and a great role model for me all my life. So we're excited for the reunion going on on the other side of the veil. The morning is different than it would be for another kind of death, as you may know. This presentation is based on a request that came to me from Chaplain Franklin at Fort Stewart, Georgia in the year 2000. He was assigned to an artillery battalion, and the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Gwilliam, said to his chaplain, can we do some kind of class that would be preventive for spouse and child abuse? We've had increasing incidents of spouse and child abuse in this unit for two years, and it just won't seem to go down. Do you guys have some kind of class you can give? And just before Chaplain Franklin had come to my office with this request, that was like a Tuesday morning, the prior Monday, I was going home and it was my turn to prepare the lesson for family home evening. Now I know none of you would do this, but on the way home, I went by Blockbuster Movie to see if there was something we could watch with my girls for family night. And this is a GI town, and what was there in the Blockbuster video wasn't necessarily fair that I would want to bring home. But I stumbled on a BBC documentary called Monty Roberts, A Real Horse Whisperer. And the reason BBC invested in this film is that Monty who's from California and has been training horses for 50 plus years, trains horses with no violence whatsoever, and the Queen of England liked his material. She invited him to England and had him train her equestrian leaders with Monty's methods. And that got the attention of the British public. Why would the Queen dump all our centuries of tradition in training our own horses to ride English style? and adopt this method of training that Monty does. Well, you'll see that. And the class you're going to watch is with ROTC cadets at Brigham Young University. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Dewey Boberg, who and his students, who let me use that as a venue to film the class we're going to watch. It's 43 minutes long. We're going to have a couple of excerpted films from the BBC documentary. I also used at Fort Stewart, the first time I gave this class, uh, some excerpts from the movie McClintock that features John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. There's a chase scene, you could call it that, or a stalking scene in that movie where Maureen O'Hara is in progressive stages of distress and undress, Western style, and there are some amazing cliches regarding family violence that are in this film. 
So I called Bat Jack Productions in California and spoke with Gretchen Wayne, John Wayne's daughter-in-law, who's now in charge. His son, uh, I think it's Peter, uh, died uh, in 2003. So my dialogue with them began in 2000 and ended with permissions this year <laughs> to use the film. And you'll see two segments from that film that'll talk about family values in a negative way and in a positive way. So let's roll it, please. And if you want to even turn down the lights, I don't think they'll go to sleep. They just had a snack and it hasn't been lunch yet. So it should be good. Okay. We have a, a, special, uh, a special treat really today with Jeff, right? You will find as you're in your army service, there's not a ton of LDS chaplains out there. But the truth is we have two retired full colonel chaplains that did very long and distinguished careers and Jeff Bobert is one of those. And I'm gonna turn the time over to him because he has about 15 minutes worth of good material. Uh, this class will cover several different topics. I'll give you a summary at the end and I'll give you a summary at the beginning. We're gonna cover spouse and child abuse prevention. We're gonna cover suicide prevention. We're gonna cover divorce proofing. And we're gonna cover spirituality. All that in 15 minutes. And we're going to walk a road that will also talk to us about the power of gentleness, the power of gentleness in our lives and in relationships. I typically tell soldiers, your greatest beauty and your greatest happiness in your life are typically tied to relationships. When I say that, you can usually put a face on either side of that, positive or negative. And we'll come back to that at the very end. In 19, uh, the year 2000, in Fort Stewart, Georgia, I was yeah, we need this a deputy command chaplain. And uh, one of the battalion chaplains, Chaplain Franklin, came to me and said, can you help me with my artillery battalion? We have a major problem that's been ongoing for two years. We have increasing spouse and child abuse every month for 24 months. Have you got a class on this topic that you can give us that would help us? I said, you know, Chaplain Franklin, I don't know. Uh, let me see what I can dig up and we'll put our heads together and see what we can come up with. So I learned also that Fort Stewart had the highest rates of spouse and child abuse in Forces Command. And I thought, how could this be? Fort Bragg is a much bigger place. There's a lot more soldiers, 10,000 more soldiers than Fort Stewart. How could that be that this base, kind of isolated, has such high numbers? And as we looked into it, here's what I learned. Fort Stewart is rather isolated. It's 25.1 miles inland. It is 48 miles south of Savannah, Georgia. It's a farming community. All the local gendarmerie, the local police, and the county sheriffs all have an agreement with the commander at Fort Stewart. If someone's case for spouse or child abuse, domestic violence, pops up, and if somebody has an ID card, that is automatically referred to the base commander. So that's pretty good screening. So it wasn't that I think we had higher numbers than Fort Bragg. I think it was showing up because we had a better screening method than Fort Bragg has, or other bases like Fort Hood and so on. So then I thought, well, and we were averaging 24 cases per month of confirmed child abuse and 24 cases of spouse abuse per month on that base of 30,000 soldiers. That's unacceptable. So end of the video day, it's Monday, I'm going home, and it was my turn to do family home meeting lesson, and I have not prepared the lesson yet. And that may not have ever happened to any of you, but I went to Blockbuster to see if there was a movie that we could all watch as a family for family night, eat popcorn, and uh, it took a long time. I was there maybe an hour and a half, because it's a GI town, and the movies they had, you wouldn't want to take home to your children, your daughters in, partic in particular. But I stumbled on a BBC documentary called Monty Roberts, A Real Horse Whisperer. And the reason BBC and QE Education in Britain did a story on a California horse whisperer named Monty Roberts was because the Queen of England was interested in how he trained horses. He trains horses without violence. And so I'm going to show you an expert of that training here on the film. And do if you'll catch the picture. We'll take a look at how Monty trains horses. is to break this barrier. Monty Roberts is renowned throughout the horse world for his remarkable ability to persuade an unbroken horse to accept a saddle and rider in less than 30 minutes, a process that normally takes weeks. Two years ago, QED showed how Monty does it. Perhaps because it is so amazing to watch and seems so easy, some think Monty must be cheating by using partially tamed horses. 
ahead now. So to prove like them wrong, he's decided to put himself on the line. His method will face the ultimate test as Monty tries this on a Mustang in the wild. However, many are convinced that this time he'll fail. But there's a very happy horse. It is going to happen. How do I know that? The horse has told me. For 50 years, they've been telling me. Monty is a friend of mine. I saw this, and we'll see some more segments of this, of how he actually trains the horses without using any kind of violence. And I thought, well, you know, Chaplain Franklin, this could be a metaphor for the idea that in relationships, gentleness is powerful. Gentleness in homes and families draws people to parents, draws parents to each other, draws children to parents. Gentleness is actually really powerful, but it's indirect and it's also countercultural. Ready for our next segment. I wasn't in the horse business till I was three. I was showing horses in competition before the age of reason. My father used me as basically a calling card to his riding school. If this four-year-old, then five, six, and seven-year-old could just whip all the competition up to, say, 16 years of age, um, you ought to go to that school, you know? All right, talent set to go. Prescott, here's where it all began. Help him. Monty grew up in the Western riding tradition and as a young man started to compete in rodeos. I won masses of championships in, in rodeo. I won the national championship in 1957. I wasn't a particularly talented rodeo competitor. I worked like heck at it and uh, got good enough to win. I enjoyed it though. Showing my horses and rodeoing was my life for about 22 years or so. In those days, part of that Western tradition was the way a horse was broken. The technique was often harsh and horrified Monty when he watched it as a boy. If you tie a hind leg up on a horse and you put him on a pulley high on a post, and every time he jumps or fights to resist whatever you're doing with him, you pull his head right up high. It supposedly causes him to be so uncomfortable when he does that that he quits. And, and in, as a matter of fact, he does quit. Um, I watched my father breaking horses uh, in what I consider to be a most abusive way and they would come gentle. Um, and ultimately, they would do their job. Again, my opinion is they didn't do their job as well as they would have done it if they did it because they wanted to, not because they're forced to. Well, part of the point Monty's bringing up here is that gentleness is more powerful and gets better results than force in our homes. We use force with children or in relationships because we get frustrated. We don't know what else to use. And we'll tie this at the end of the class to Doctrine and Covenants, section 121, where the Savior's voice, given through Joseph Smith, tells us about the power of gentleness, the same word. So I started seeing this film, and I sat down with Chaplain Franklin, and we said, well, maybe we need something a little more than just this particular presentation done by Monty to kind of get everybody's attention. because." In this unit, they had kind of a unit attitude that was, if that filming won't do what you want, you use your spurs. That was kind of the attitude they had regarding men women relationships. It's pretty negative, very negative, in fact, and abusive. So we took this material and also an excerpt from the movie McClintock with John Wayne. I think that's our next segment, correct? Second. Next on our method. Method part two. We'll come to this then. So this is how Monty trains horses. We'll see this kind of in a short piece. Wild horse races are the ultimate invasion of uh, a wild creature. These animals are gathered uh, in the wild, trapped, they're trucked to an event. If someone could just start to look at it from the eyes of the horse, 
and realize the terror that must come over them. To be treated in that fashion is just, it's just dead wrong. I grew up watching this event. I competed in this event. My, oh my. Very bold. You have lined them up with horses. As soon as I got to know the wild horse, I hated every minute of it. It's wrong. Monty first really got to know wild horses when he was 14. He had gone out to Nevada to trap them for a wild horse race. And as he stalked them, he learned something surprising about their behavior. My first discovery was that the black stallion didn't lead the family group. I always thought the stallion in the movies, you know, when I was a child, he was in charge of everything. Well, stallions aren't in charge of much of anything. They're in charge of getting the mares pregnant, and they're in charge of protecting their harem from being taken away by other stallions. End of story. What I saw was that it's the mare. It's the female, generally an older female. She's the one who makes the rules. She's the one who says where we'll eat today, the direction we'll travel, where we'll drink, when we'll drink. She will babysit with multiples of youngsters and be a role model for those youngsters, telling them what was acceptable, what wasn't, and scolding them when they were wrong. And I discovered that the scolding process was to isolate. Now, what is this? Send that little guy out there and leave him out there on his own. And he knew, somehow he knew he's supposed to stay out there. Being isolated from the herd is a sentence of death. The predators will come along and see an isolated grazer. Within 48 to 72 hours, they will die. Their herd instincts are incredibly strong. They have power in numbers. And if several mares are kicking at a mountain lion, they can do him a lot of harm. And remember that a mountain lion with his teeth kicked in is a dead mountain lion. So he doesn't want to be hurt. He wants the easiest prey he can find. An isolated grazer is like smorgasbord. The dominant mare, when she sent the colt out there, she would be communicating with him that he's to stay out there. And I saw how she communicated, eyes on eyes, square shoulders, it kept him out there for maybe two hours. And when she felt he'd paid enough of a price for whatever action he had done negative, she would walk in a circle and she'd start to make her motions round and sort of drop her head like this and look away. And he'd start to come back in. And he would slip back into the group. Well, it was a revelation to me. Then I'd go home and start fiddling about with it with my horses. And I was, wow, it's right, you know? Even my body, not built like the horse, would cause this reaction and response uh, to the language. Right. So Monty has developed what he calls Equus, the language of horses. It's a language of movement, a language of body motion, and a language of uh, speed, speed of motion. And so he teaches this at his ranch called Flags Up Farms in Sylvain, California. Last May, May, my wife and I were out at Monty's ranch for his birthday party, a barbecue, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the neighbors were all gathered. And I got a chance to thank Monty for the work that he's been doing, because he started programs now with veterans, where he invites veterans who have PTSD, some of them severe cases of PTSD, to his ranch, and he puts them in the circle pen with the horse. Let me see what that looks like. Monty calls this horse language equus. He uses it when he tames a horse to take a saddle and a rider. It's the key to his success. This horse is used to wearing a head collar but has not been broken in. What Monty is going to do now is imitate the behavior of a dominant mare. He's got a few little battle scars on him Monty's technique has been studied by animal behaviorist Dr. Robert Miller. Monty wants this horse to see him as a surrogate herd leader. For example, in his round pen techniques, takes a, a line and frightens the horse by throwing it out. That's a frightening visual stimulus. The horse moves and, and he keeps it moving. And he keeps the horse moving until 
Uh, the horse has gone its biological flight distance roughly a quarter of a mile. Basically, it's just a little bit farther than a lion is capable of charging. Eyes on eyes, all my motions square. It runs that distance and then turns around to see what it was that frightened it. You run first, then analyze what it was. This is typical equine behavior. And then the horse will start to signal with body language, lowering the head, licking the lips, and chewing. It starts to signal, I'm in big trouble. I've run the necessary distance. That thing is still chasing me. I'm afraid I'm going to die. I need help. I need a leader. And the only game in town is the man in the center of the pan. If he drops his head down near the soil, it means that if we could have a meeting, I'd let you be the chairman of the meeting. If he licks and chews, it means I'm a herbivore. There's the head down. So that means I'll let you be the chairman of the meeting. When the horse signals a sufficient level of submissiveness, Monty suddenly becomes passive and non-threatening. Attempt to draw him. I'm going to tell you when the licking and chewing. He turns away, lowers his gaze. He immediately becomes passive. To cause him to understand that I've moved from aggressive to passive. Good licking and chewing. This horse then comes to him and in effect asks, would you help me? Are you my leader? I need help. And he then, without threatening the horse, very quietly strokes the horse. Round movements instead of square movements. Reward him now for coming to me. And the horse, you'll see, gratefully moves his head, licks his lips, and says, well, thank you. I'm so glad. Then he has what he calls join up. In an effort to accomplish follow up. Follow up. Perfect. Good licking and chewing. Then as he moves around, the horse does the horse thing. He follows the leader. And the more he follows him, the more comfortable he is. Horses seek comfort. OK. When I saw this, I thought, well, here's the key. This is a physical representation of a scriptural principle that says that gentleness is powerful and that we who hold the priesthood in the LDS church should use this with love on faith in our homes. And so, could I use this with non-Latter-day Saints to communicate the same principle? So if you can picture a theater full of 400 soldiers, Moon Theater at Fort Stewart, Georgia, we used as kind of a kickoff for this, uh, this presentation regarding Monty. And then we'll see an application of this in kind of a humorous way in the John Wayne movie that we have permission to use. But you need to know the reaction of Monty's dad as a teenager told his dad what he was doing. Let's see this. Go down here where the dogs Monty's radically different methods are very impressive. However, years ago, when Monty as a boy first told his father of his ideas, he got a very strange reaction. My father was uh, extremely upset. I mean, he didn't want me trying anything except what he told me to try. And so what he saw was a horse that came to me, stood with me, and accepted its first saddle with nothing on its head. It just stayed there because it wanted to, and he couldn't handle it. I mean, if that was right, and it would work, it destroyed his life. All the things that he had done before that were wrong, and he couldn't handle it. And when I looked up at him, he had his mouth open, and his first words were, what the hell am I raising? And I didn't expect that. I was such an idealistic child that I thought uh, I was doing a good thing. And uh, he took a piece of chain and beat me till I was in the hospital. Oh, sure, I resented him for it. If someone is uh, grossly unfair to you and physically abusive to you, you ought to resent it. I don't, I don't hate my father. I don't hate any of the... If it wasn't for my father's really tough handling of horses, I probably never would have been dedicated enough to do what I'm doing. So in a way, he did me a great favor by swinging the pendulum so far toward pain and restraint 
that he caused me to have to find a better way. So a better way for Monty, and he's been doing this now for 50 years. He's famous all over the world. The reason QED in Britain did this uh, uh, BBC documentary on Monty Roberts at his ranch in California is that the Queen of England heard about Monty's method, Queen Elizabeth, and she was interested and invited Monty to work with some of her horse folks, the equestrian, the Queen's equestrian. And so he went to England, and now Monty, she is his patron. She asked Monty to train all her leaders with horses in England. And that got a lot of attention in England because they're very, very proud of the English riding style. The, the equestrian stuff that they do. How could this guy from California capture the queen's interest? But he did, cap and still has her interest. And uh, Monty was there for her Jubilee celebration in England as an invited guest. He's done programs for her all over the country. October is England month. He goes to England and works with the queen. She sends him all over the place. Well, that's been interesting to watch his life unfold as he's done this. So now, we found this particular scene from the movie McClintock. Are you familiar with the movie, anybody? It stars John Wayne, Marine O'Hara. Uh, Marine O'Hara plays a character you hope gets a lickin' in the end of the movie, kind of a witchy lady, John Wayne's wife in the movie. His name in the movie is G.W. And so they have this altercation, and finally he decides she needs a steak. So there's a stalking scene going through the streets of this western town on a 4th of July parade, and festivities complete with rodeo, wild Indians, and you name it, it's all in there. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna take a look at this scene, and we're gonna see if we can capture some of the cliches that are actually part of family and use. We have permission to use this. How long, GW? How long what? Cat, she's been riding herd on you for two years now. I'm a peaceable man. But my father used to say, you raise your voice, it doesn't do any good. It's time to raise your hand. Well, I've been planning to do something. Did you hear what this guy's name is Birnbaum? Did you hear what he said? When they stop listening with their ears, it's time to use Talking. your hand. Talking won't do That's any good. That's a familiar good. idea from this era, the 1960s. This movie came out in 1960. Who is it? It's me. Let me in. Not now. <laughs> right now. Are you insane? I want to talk to you. It'll have to wait. <laughs> I've taken all I'm going to take from you. You are insane. You are going to tell me why you packed up, picked up, and walked out on me. Two years ago, you remember, you came home from Denver with lipstick all over your... Ah! Ah! Lipstick on my collar. Who cares? Why, you big... What she's wearing in the day passes for underwear. Is your curious? G.W., you are a ruffian. Cuthbert, you are right. This is his daughter. Well, what kind of a family is that? <laughs> the best! The children are the parents. <laughs>
never met oh, me. Oh, belly aching, fight all you want. It won't do you any good. You've been digging those burrs into me for two years. Now you're going to get your comeuppance. Oh, oh, you... Thanks. Oh, my father would be proud of you. Okay, that's pretty much the end of the movie. That's funny, unless you're the person in their underwear being stalked through the streets, right? We showed this to the soldiers, they all thought it was kind of fun, they got a big laugh out of it. Unless you're the person receiving the violence, then it isn't funny. Are we agreed on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. sir. That's kind of how it was. We spoke with Bad Jack Productions, who owns the rights, the copyrights to this film, and I spoke with Gretchen Wayne, that's the daughter-in-law of John Wayne. His son Patrick plays a role in the movie also, the big tall guy, and uh, marries <coughs> GW's daughter in the story. And uh, Gretchen and I had this long discussion. They were concerned that we would portray John Wayne as a, a guy that was an abuser. They were concerned that we would do this and show it in a real negative light. She said, there's also a scene in the movie that's very positive, that portrays family values. And I said, and we can include that, and we'll include that today before we're done. But as I talked to Gretchen, I explained that in the military, John Wayne is an icon. You can't badmouth John Wayne in the military, especially where I come from in the Special Forces community. The guy who did the Green Beret movies, also done by the same Bad Jack Productions. So yeah, no, we don't go down that road. In fact, a friend of mine in the Special Forces qualification course got major demerits for daring to use Savoy 6 as a call sign, which was John Wayne's call sign in the movie, The Green Berets. So, we have to be careful about how we speak about this, but I felt this is a common illustration of the advancing role of violence in media in our culture. Our culture has gone off the charts with regard to media. The window that Marino O'Hara jumped through is made of what we call candy glass. It's a really pliable, easily breakable stuff that they use for stunts like this. And it was the Western scene in movies, the saloon brawl fight scene, that brought about candy glass. You can also make bottles out of candy glass, and you'll see in a barroom fight scene, somebody will take a glass and hit it over someone's head. If you actually do that with one of those old whiskey bottles, do you know what would happen? It would crush someone's skull, because they used really heavy glass. But the candy glass, of course, breaks off and looks really effective, and that's part of the movie. Now, with digital graphic interface and computers, we can make violence appear everything but the smell. We can make it look like it's totally real. It's hard to discern between what is real and what isn't in movies with regard to violence. And it's so escalated in our culture that we accept it as normal. And that's a problem. That's a problem when we bring it home. And the problem with our soldiers is we've been at war since 911, since 2001. And we have been in conflict and deployed repeatedly time after time after time. We do 12 months in Iraq, 12 months in Afghanistan, come home, six months, six to 12 months for a dwell time, go right back with a new, same unit or a different unit, and we'll come home again. And families are starting to break down from the stress. PTS, post-traumatic stress, is common in our culture. And if I have physical symptoms that go longer than six months, I then have post-traumatic stress disorder. Half of my chaplains show PTSD symptoms because they've been deployed so much, as well as our soldiers. So this is a significant thing. And the commander, when we gave this class, we are talking about violence, he said, well, chaplain, I don't want to have a bunch of namby pambies in my combat line battalion. I said, right, but you don't want them to come home and bring the war home, do you? And he said, no, actually, I don't. I said, good, I think we're in agreement. So the whole point of the class is to point out that home should not be a battlefield. Relationships should not be a battlefield. And I need to find a better way to communicate at home without violence, especially with children, but also between a husband and wife. And so that was the whole point of this class. It was a lot of fun to talk to these soldiers. And these were principles they'd never seen before. Never seen before. Joseph Smith was asked by a reporter, and John Taylor reported this in the Millennial Star. How do you control so many people? Thousands of people have joined your church. They're coming here to Nauvoo. How do you control them? And Joseph said, I don't control them. I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. 
And so for a lot of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, this whole class is based on that idea. Let me teach and illustrate a correct principle that gentleness is powerful and you apply it at home, see how it works. Now, with deference to Gretchen Wayne and at her request, we'll see this brief scene, which is an exchange between Don, John Wayne and his daughter. And she's asking him, Dad, when I get married, what are you going to get? Let's see. Becky. Come here. He's been out pheasant hunting. There's something I ought to tell you. I guess now's as good a time as any. You're gonna have every young buck west of the Missouri around here trying to marry you. Mostly because you're a handsome filly. But partly because I own everything in this country from here to there. They'll think you're gonna inherit it. Well, you're not. I'm gonna leave most of it to... Well, to the nation, really, for a park where no lumberman will cut down all the trees for houses with leaky roofs. Nobody will kill all the beaver for hats for dudes, nor murder the buffalo for robes. What I'm going to give you is a 500 cow spread on the upper Green River. Now, that may not seem like much, but it's more than we had, your mother and I. Some folks are going to say I'm doing all this so I can sit up in the hereafter and look down on a park named after me. Or that I was disappointed in you. Didn't want you to get all that money. But the real reason, Becky, is because I love you. And I want you and some young man to have what I had. Because all the gold in the United States Treasury and all the harp music in heaven can't equal what happens between a man and a woman with all that growing together. I can't explain it any better than that. All right, Daddy. Yep. It's a pretty good little <laughs> segment. I like that. John Wayne lived a lot of family values, his son Patrick. And uh, Bad Jack Productions released the film McClintock in 1963 after John Kennedy had been assassinated. The whole country was looking for an uplift, and this was part of it. It was a very popular film. I like it for a lot of reasons. <coughs> now, Monty uses principles of gentleness in his home. He and his wife Pat have three children, but they were also foster parents to 47 foster children. And he uses these same principles, and I'm going to let him talk about this in this next little segment about how he works with foster kids in his illness. Okay. It's been said by good horsemen that if learning is one to 10, the most important part of learning is zero to one. It's the same with children, I believe. If children can hear positive things about tiny little improvements, they respond very favorably. At his farm in California, Monty's theories about horses have been applied to raising children. He and his wife, Pat, have three children of their own and dozens of foster children. We had 47 foster children. Almost all of them came to us at 11, 12, and 13 years of age, which is long after life's patterns have already been deeply set in. Steve Arlano is now a successful businessman living in California. But as a young teenager in San Francisco, he was becoming rather wild. Steve Arlano came to me at uh, about 15 years of age. He was on a course to have uh, some real problems in his life. And I'd like to think that the time that he spent with me put him on a positive course. Um, I guess he would be the final judge as to whether that was c the case or not. We did some pretty uh, silly things. I was in fights on a regular basis. And we lived near the uh, University of San Francisco, and we broke into buildings to play pinball. One particular time, the San Francisco police came in and were chasing us. And my father stepped out of the apartment and heard the 
officer say, stop or I'll shoot. Monty believes that the way he dealt with these problems was similar to the techniques he uses with his horses. I wasn't until a few years ago he, he, he had told me that, well, I use that technique on you. At the time, I didn't know what te technique he was talking about. The psychology isn't any different in its basic principles. You don't put a child in a round pen and send him away by flicking a line at him. But in human terms, you do the same thing putting them to work when they're negative, and giving them great positive consequences when they're positive. Any little thing, find that thing that he can do positive and reward him for it. It may seem very unimportant to you, but it may be the most important thing that, that in that child's life because it may be the first step in the right direction. If he pushed me away, I certainly didn't think anything poorly of it. And when he pulled me back in, I just enjoyed that. I think he brought us in because he wanted to help kids, and he didn't do it yelling, screaming, or any way. Just let me know what was what taught me wrong from right. Bill Terry came to me a very aggressive sort of a kid. First thing he did was come up to me and say, "Hey, Turkey, what do you want?" I said, "What I want is that from this day forward, you will call me Mr. Roberts." and uh, you will not be disrespectful at all. That's what I want. Well, you're not going to get that. You know. Yeah, I probably am going to get that. But, Billy, I'm going to work to get you to want to give me that rather than to tell you you have to give me that. So you call me whatever you want. I was cocky. <laughs> uh, I was very outgoing and I went to work on him on this very principle that we've been discussing. He got negative consequences for negative actions, and he spent some time digging ditches and scrubbing toilets to the point where he'd stand up in your face and say he's not going to do it, you know? And then you'd list the further negatives that that would get him. Bill Cherry was training to be a jockey, and one of his jobs was to exercise horses every day. Sometimes it didn't feel like riding all the horses. <laughs> and I remember one day, uh, I think I had about 10 mounts. And uh, when we ride the horses, we used to mark it off on a sheet. Well, I think I only rode about eight, but still marked off 10. And um, went home, took a shower, and Monty approached me and says, how was the ride today? I said, good. He goes, did you ride all your horses? I said, yeah. He goes, why are you lying to me? I got caught. He says, I want you here after school, I want you to ride the horses. Um, so that taught me never to do that again, to cheat. He spent some really tough time uh, paying the price for negative consequences. And it was five days until he walked up to me, stuck his hand out and said, Mr. Roberts, boy, I gotta... <sighs> anyway, uh, he said, uh, Mr. Roberts, and from that point forward, I was either Dad, Pops, or Mr. Roberts. Got a wonderful family now. Happened to Billy Cherry in the end is the most incredible, positive story you can tell. So Monty Roberts practices what he preaches at home. He'd put up two chalkboards in the barn with the kids. One, he'd write, describe the negative behavior they were doing. And he would say, if you'll stop that behavior, here's the reward. And it usually meant time with money doing something. And then he said, if you'll keep doing that behavior, we're going to do something negative that you'll think is negative. Money said, they've dug more pipelines than they have pipe to fill out of the bridge. <laughs> but then he writes, positive behavior, he'd like those kids to adopt. He said, if you'll do this or even work toward it, here's the reward for doing that. He didn't use money or food for rewards. It usually meant time with him doing something. And the common denominator on both of those chalkboards was this. You have my committed time. You can have it for doing negative stuff, and I'll supervise you. Or we can do fun stuff together. It's up to you. But you have my committed time. And that has changed lives. I thought that's a powerful lesson. When Joseph Smith was in Liberty Jail, the Savior, speaking to him, gave him 
these verses from section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants. These verses explain the priesthood leadership. And you'll see a thread regarding gentleness and love unfeigned throughout this. Got a reader? How about? Please. 39. We have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men. As soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Unrighteous dominion. Those are two words from the Savior that, in my view, describe poor leadership in the home. And I will tell you as a military officer, I think it's poor leadership in a unit. I've worked for commanders that we would call screamers, that would be a tyrant and run a tirade. They don't last very long and they don't rise very far, thankfully, in the military. Leaders who are gentle and competent rise much better. Let's hear this next one. 41 and 42, got a reader? Please. 41, no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness, by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without God. Okay. To me, these are rules for relationships. Love unfeigned, long suffering, gentleness, and meekness. And when I've seen this in parents, as they raise their children, I think they're more successful. Now, here's a thread to pull this together and talk about modern negative behaviors to wrap this up. If your greatest sorrow and your greatest happiness is based in relationships, right? And I take that as a true statement myself. With God, with a significant spouse, children, and other family members, the failure of those relationships brings sadness and loneliness and even isolation and can also lead to hopelessness. Now, not everybody around the world agrees what leads to suicide, but they do agree that hopelessness leads to suicide. I'm of the opinion that when we're working relationships on these principles, we're standing at the headwaters way above negative behaviors like spouse and child abuse and suicide by preventing those things from happening in the first place before hope goes away. I think that's a positive thing. So I see this idea of these principles applied in your life and mine as preventive for divorce, spouse abuse, child abuse, even suicide. Because I'm connecting myself to principles that come from God, are revealed to the earth through a living prophet. I'm applying those principles to relationships in my life and letting the outcome flow. Monty doesn't control horses. He invited me and some chaplains from Fort Stewart to see a show he did at, at Atlanta, Georgia, at the Conyers Horse in International Horse Park. And as we watched him previewing stock in the morning for the evening show, they brought in a pinto with its necks arched like rocks and its tail straight up. And this pinto got in the circle pen with the trainer that Monty had trained. And that horse ran for the trainer, spun around before it got to him, and put both hind feet where that guy's head was. And Monty said, this horse has been abused. And it regards humans as a threat. It's going to try and kill him. I said, so that's not in the show, right? He said, no, 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 no. We want that one in the lane. I said, right. OK, this is interesting. So that night, out comes the black and white pinto. And Monty's in the circle pit. I thought, this is going to be interesting. For Monty, it takes longer to achieve join up with a horse that's been abused, which means 26 minutes instead of 21. <laughs> it's incredible to watch. When the horse finally achieves join up and knows that it's safe, the bonding is powerful. You can see it in the middle of the circle pin. And in the audience, it's not uncommon for someone to faint when they see this happen with an, abuse, an animal that's been abused. And the person that faints is typically someone, when he's talked to a lot of them, who were abused in their own lifetime. And watching this process of someone feeling safe, being free from abuse, is liberating. And that person can faint. So that's drawn Monty into the human behavior world, and that's where I get involved as a chaplain. Helping teach these principles to soldiers and other chaplains that gentleness is powerful and we need to include it in our lives and our leadership as leaders. I've heard some of the softest phrases from commanders. 
in the term of a rebuke without the screaming. A commander said to one officer, do you remember when you used to be a captain? This guy says, what do you mean used to be? He said, let me tell you the consequence of this behavior if you continue. You'll be demoted. And it was a very quiet conversation. Well, God bless you as you learn to be leaders and apply these in your homes. Do you have any questions for me? We've got maybe a minute or two. Please. So what were the uh, outcomes you saw in Fort Stewart after you started The numbers went down. The spouse and child abuse numbers went down, and uh, they did so for the next year. I ordered 23 copies of this BBC film to show to uh, my chaplains and do a class. Monty sent his own trainer from California to Fort Stewart for the class. And we did the whole base. And we saw all our numbers go down in force come. It was a very positive thing. The very next year, when we wanted to do a longer study, they went to war in Iraq, the current Gulf War. So we couldn't continue that. But I've been using this with chaplains for a long time. Any other questions? That's a good question. Thank you. Mark? OK. Thank you, Colonel. Awesome, sir. Thanks. Now, this is a budget film, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, a starving IT student at BYU helped me put it together. It's amazing what you can do with a talented soul that needs some money. <laughs> so we made about 96 copies of the film, and we've distributed some of those to chaplains here, and we can distribute more if it's helpful to you. The principles are true. They come from the Savior. As we teach the Doctrine and Covenants, we use this phrase, the Doctrine and Covenants is the literary voice of Jesus Christ. The Doctrine and Covenants is the literary voice of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith heard the Savior's voice, spoke the words slowly so they could be recorded, and gives us the words of Jesus. Jesus spoke English to Joseph. These words are powerful, and any time, and this is my testimony regarding our scriptures and the Bible as well, any time we apply scriptural principles in our lives, the Lord himself gives the blessing. Not the chaplain, not the chaplain assistant, the Lord himself gives the blessing. So I see this as an application of revealed and restoration scriptures that are also found in the Bible. I looked up gentleness in the King James Version of the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 35 and 36, and found this verse in 35, which we call in the army a hua verse. He teacheth my hands to war so that I can break a bow of steel with my arms. Pua. But the next verse says, at the very end, thy gentleness hath made me great. The word used with gentleness is the Hebrew anav or anava, which also means humility. The King James Version uses gentleness, but when you take humility and look at it as a world virtue, you'll see it's in all major world religions. You have a copy of a paper I did at uh, Erskine Theological, actually Columbia Theological Seminary called The Power of Gentleness, and you, there's a survey of world wisdom literature on the topic of humility and gentleness. And we find it among Native American cultures and non-Christian, non-Judeo-Christian traditions as well, among the Sikh, uh, Buddhism, among Shinto and other places. In fact, when I showed up in Japan for my final assignment as a 06 chaplain, the commander, Brigad uh, Major General Perkins, said to me, uh, Chaplain Boatwright, here in your, on an assignment in Japan, you need to park your ego at the door because it doesn't play well in Japan. They love humility. In fact, on an accident form in the police departments, there's a line that reads, did the parties involved in the accident express the idea that they're sorry the accident happened? <laughs> That's a line on the accident report form. The word in Japanese is called sumimasen. It's kind of like, excuse me. And that's on there on the accident form with the police. Did they do this? So um, 
let's take your